This video is a commentary on Veritasium's video and also a little bit on EEV Blog's criticism of his video. The name of Veritasium's video is The Big Misconception About Electricity. It was just posted recently on November 19th, 2021. It already has 5 million views already. But at the 11 minute 16 second mark of that video, I found a glaring error. And so my video is focusing on that one screenshot position of his video. And my I might as well already lay in my criticism of the fellow over at EEV blog is that when he criticizes or comments on Veritasium's video, he skips right past that section of the video. So that, <laughs> as if it's not important, but I wouldn't be bringing it up if I didn't think it was important, so they're both at fault on that respect. Now the section of Veritasium's video that EEV blog skipped past has to do with the transatlantic cable um, that was laid down in the 1800s, the latter half of the 1800s, and the way that um, Oliver Heaviside went about solving the problem. And there's a bit of misrepresentation, to put it mildly. What Veritasium claims is that the solution that Oliver Heaviside promoted was incorrect, yet it's the one that worked. They also don't mention that the solution was not the initial attempt. The initial attempt that wasn't working was not sheathed in iron at all. That only came about because of Oliver Heaviside's suggestion on how to solve the problem. And only after Oliver Heaviside had managed to come up with what has now come to be known as the telegrapher's equations of Oliver Heaviside, because he put in the mathematical format the problem which suggested the solution, which was to take the insulated copper cable and wrap it in iron wire or iron uh, ribbon, and then encase that so that the magnetic field could keep up with the electric field and not dissipate and fall out of phase, and thus create a garbled uh, message at the, s at the receiving end, or no message at all in some cases. Now, Oliver Heaviside's solution, um, Veritasium, the fellow there, I believe his name is Derek, according to e. E. V the guy over at EEV blog, uh, Derek um, considered that the iron sheathing was a mistake because it produced parallel capacitance, which he is saying was the cause of the problem, and that was not the cause of the problem. The cause of the problem was a poor transmission of the magnetic field along the length of that copper wire. Copper does not transmit the, or emit for that matter, the magnetic field very well by comparison to iron. Copper does an excellent job of transmitting or transferring the electric field over a vast distance. And so there's no problem combining the two. In fact, uh, later editions of the solution, they did not extend the iron wrapping all the way to the shoreline, to the station where the cable, the, the two endpoints of the cable. They actually um, receded, you know, removed a portion of the iron wrapping several miles prior, or extending away, I should I say, from the endpoint, the two endpoints of the transmission line, um, leaving the copper wire. Uh, cable bare other than its insulation, but no iron wrapping at those two endpoints for a few miles. And this improved efficiency. But the iron wire was not connected to anything. It simply wrapped around. It, it served, it basically was the first coax cable that Oliver, he Oliver Heaviside is the inventor of. But the cable was bare with no co coaxial iron sheath um, for a few miles at either end, and that increased efficiency. Now, Veritasium claims that it's the parallel capacitance generated between the floating plate conductor of the iron wrapping and the um, non-floating plate uh, copper wire at the center 
and the insulation in between acting as a dielectrical material storing the charge. And that would be the case if the insulation was very thin. But in those days, no, that was not the case. And of course, the t telegraph cable couldn't afford to have thin insulation because of all of the stress and strain occurring both in laying the cable and the cable just sitting there as well and accidentally getting knocked by some trawler for, for all we know. So the insulation was quite thick and all we have to do to make sure parallel capacitance does not show up is to increase that thickness uh, to whatever degree is required if it's not already thick enough to begin with. So it's not really much of a criticism uh, because it's not even the cause of the problem anyway. All right. Now, let's see, what else? It turns out that this um, sheathing of an insulated copper wire with a iron wire, whether the iron is insulated or bare, makes no difference because we may not want to connect the iron wire in a bifilar uh, fashion to the copper wire. We may or may not. You know, it depends on the circuit situation. But in the case of Nathan Stubblefield, who made his earth battery patent around the same time as Oliver Heaviside's telegraph solution had occurred, historically speaking, and Nathan Stubblefield applied it to his uh, kind of a transformer situation in which he took that Oliver Heaviside transatlantic cable solution and wrapped it around an iron bolt. So now we have Nathan Stubblefield's um, elect uh, excuse me, copper wire sheathed, or I should say insulated, with a cotton sleeve. And then alongside that is wrapped with it iron bare wire around an iron bolt to make a sort of transformer, but it's not really a transformer, but it's sort of a transformer. So there's a lot of precedents for the correct interpretation of what's going on here, and no precedents for the incorrect uh, interpretation, as Derek would have his version as he presents it, is, is. It's, it's, it has no precedence. It, it has no analog to anything else. Nobody else has done what he's describing, so it really it exists out all by itself. It's never been replicated by anyone. Why should they? Because it's not the right way to approach um, d diagnosing the problem and its uh, relevant solution. It turns, a it turns out that the correct interpretation that I'm offering is actually has even more precedence than Nathan Stubblefield. It goes to Edward Leeds Collinan's perpetual motion holder or the principle of magnetic remanence used in computer core memory dating from the years 1955 to 1975 inclusive. This idea that if you inject a DC signal into an iron or ferromagnetic toroid, you know, a donut-shaped ring of ferromagnetic material, and then you only do it for an instant, a DC pulse, and then you terminate that pulse, you now have a memory, a signature, <coughs> of that injection, g zipping around, or maybe not zipping around, but oriented in the polarity at to which you had applied it, and it stays in that ferromagnetic mass of toroidal shape in for eternity, in perpetuity. It does not go away. And this was why it was used in computer core memory for two decades, because it was the best system they could come up with at the time, and it worked and it didn't require any energy to speak of. I mean, it doesn't require any minimum amount of energy to uh, put the signature in the iron. But once it's there, it stays there forever and until you release it by offering uh, a different polar polarization of uh, injection of charge. And when you do that, the energy is released and then the new orientation is injected into there, which is kind of like how trans AC transformers work when they switch phases. In, be in between each half phase, um, they terminate the prior DC half phase by injecting the opposite polarity that releases the energy out of the iron core that was stored there from the primary. Now it gets released and caught up in the secondary. And so 
that's really how AC works in a transformer situation, but we never bothered to c consider the mechanics of each half cycle of an AC cycle is really what we're discussing here in general, except that in this case, we're only dealing with one half phase and it's never more than one half phase if we just deal with the principles involved, which is magnetic remanence, the technical term. Now, for repetition's sake and for emphasis' sake, there is no resistance per se because it's not energy like we normally think of it. So there's no magnetic re uh, resistance to the signature, the magnetic remanence that is put into the iron to toroid. That's why it stays there forever in the original uh, format of the polarization that was applied to begin with. So this is the correct interpretation of the transatlantic cable problem and how it was solved and not the way Veritasium presents it. And then as a last footnote, I'll give you a little uh, teaser or a freebie. Um, in Nathan Stubblefield's patent for his Earth battery, uh, there's a third coil which people, including Nathan, presented to be a load coil. But it is not a load coil. It is a frequency modulation coil intended to regulate the behavior, the activity, the amplification of the two other coils, the main coils, the copper she uh, coil sheath with cotton sleeve and the uh, bare iron wire by filer wound alongside that. And this goes back to the principle of mag amps that were, well, nobody knows who invented them or when, but they came into use for theater lighting in the 1840s, I believe it was. Um, and it's this idea of saturating the core of a transformer from a third coil. And it, b it helps boost or amplify. That's why it's called a mag amp. But nobody has discussed the aspect of frequency, which is potential energy. It's not kinetic, but frequency is potential energy and it has an impact on kinetic energy. And it depends on the situation, you know, which way what the outcome will be when you modify the frequency. But in this case, under simulation, I discovered that increasing the frequency increases, or allows, I should say, the increase of energy in a free energy uh, circuit, namely a reactive circuit, a circuit that overreacts. You know, its capacitance and its inductance is greater than its reactive capacitance and its reactive inductance is greater than the initial capacitance and the initial inductance that's in there in the solid state component. Namely, the field becomes greater than the component that originally generated that field. And that increases reactive power, which is a potential energy, before it gets converted into real power, giving us an overunity of free energy. But um, this so-called load coil is not a load coil, it's a loading coil to load the primary uh, <coughs> bifiler, you know, iron and copper winding with a frequency that you use to regulate the behavior of the primary two coils, the bifiler coils. And so you look for the turning point you know, of frequency, and above that, um, you in, you know you inject an AC uh, sine wave. It can be you know minuscule, like a microvolt or something, creating let's say a microampere in that third coil. Uh, but the significance is not the uh, so much. Well, it is significant to some degree. Yes, it is. You can increase the ampl amplitude of your input to get uh, more results than before. But the other way, and the much far easier way, is to increase merely the frequency. And when you go above a certain threshold, um, you don't have a braking effect on the overunity escalation of energy. But below that threshold, the frequency acts as a braking mechanism, much like the C magnet in an older style. Excuse me. <laughs> I've got a cough here. Similar to the braking action of a C-magnet in an older style electromechanical watt-hour meter in order to prevent, because those aluminum discs would fly, you know, spin to infinite oblivion it, without that C-magnet. So that's an overunity device sitting there right in front of our noses, or at least used to, <laughs> before we switched over to smart um, watt-hour meters. 
And so the seam magnet was put in there as a braking action to make sure that disc did not um, self-accelerate, self-escalate its spin rate. And of course, you'd be charged extra, <laughs> even though you didn't spend the extra power. <laughs> Well, because that little water armator was now generating power is what it would be doing. Oh, we can't have that. <laughs> the consumer would go, what? <laughs> so they had to keep free energy a secret for a century, and they've been doing it for over a century. Um, the, the electromechanical water armator in question that I uh, bought off of eBay was 1910. And so that's 111 years old I have in storage that has a sea magnet um, whose two ends of the sea a shape are um, positioned above and below uh, the outer edge of the aluminum perforated aluminum disc that spins on a nice brass um, spindle inside the whole contraption. So that concludes my uh, criticism, my commentary uh, of both those jerks. <laughs> Oops, sorry, <laughs> I shouldn't have said that. I'm supposed to say nice things. Well, you know, for uh, they're both electrical engineers. They should know better. But they're presenting lies, and so I have to call it like I see it, and it's pretty shitty, <laughs> I have to say. But somebody's got to speak up, and if I get att extra attention for cussing, even all the better. <laughs> I don't put myself above Shakespeare. He used the, he tried to appeal to the lowest in his audience and the highest, and everyone in between. He didn't want to let it leave anybody out, and that's how I like to do, present my material, the same way. <laughs>